Hi fifth graders, I am back here this week with Tuck Everlasting and I am about to read chapter 24. There are not very many chapters to read, so we are coming up on the end of the book. Um, we've got one today, one tomorrow, and then another one after that. So. Chapter 24. Leaving the house was so easy that Winnie felt faintly shocked. She had half expected that the instant she put a foot on the stairs that they would leap from their beds and surround her with accusations. But no one stirred. And she was struck by the realization that, if she chose, she could slip out night after night without them knowing. The thought made her feel more guilty than ever that she should once more take advantage of their trust. But tonight, this one last time, she had to. There was no other way. She opened the door and slipped out into the heavy August night. Leaving her cottage was like leaving something real and moving into a dream. Her body felt weightless as she seemed to float down the path to the gate. Jesse was there waiting. Neither of them spoke. He took her hand and they ran together lightly down the road, past other sleeping cottages, into the dim and empty center of the village. The big glass windows here were lidded eyes that didn't care, that barely saw them, barely gave them back reflections. The blacksmith shop, the mill, the church, the stores, so busy and alive in daylight, were hunched, deserted now, dark piles and shapes without a purpose or a meaning. And then, up ahead, Winnie saw the jailhouse. Its new wood still unpainted, lamplight was spilling through a window at the front. And there, in the cleared yard behind it, like a great L upside down, was the gallows. The sky flashed white, but this time it wasn't heat lightning. For a few moments later, a low mumble, still far away, announced at last a coming storm. A breeze lifted Winnie's hair, and from somewhere in the village behind them, a dog barked. Two shadows detached themselves from the gloom as Winnie and Jessie came up. Tuck pulled her to him and hugged her hard, and Miles squeezed her hand, but no one said a word. Then the four of them crept to the back of the jailhouse building. Here, too high for Winnie to see into, was a barred window through which, from the room in front, light glowed faintly. Winnie peered up at it, at the blackness of the bars, with the dim gold of light between, and into her head came lines from an old poem. Stone walls do not a prison make, nor iron bars a cage. Over and over, these lines repeated themselves in her head until they were altogether meaningless. Another roll of thunder sounded. The storm was getting nearer. Then, Miles was standing on a box. and He was pouring oil around the frame of the window. A swirl of wind brought the thick, rich smell of it down to Winnie's nostrils. Tuck handed up a tool, and Miles began to pry at the nails securing the window frame. Miles knew carpentering. Miles could do the job. Winnie shivered and held tight to Jessie's hand. One nail was free, and another. Tuck reached up to receive them as they came out one by one. A fourth nail screeched as it was pried up, and Miles poured on more oil. From the front of the jailhouse, the constable yawned noisily and began to whistle, and the whistling came nearer. Miles dropped down. They heard the constable's footsteps coming up to May's cell. The barred door clanked, and then the footsteps receded, and the whistling grew fainter, and then an inner door shut, and then the lamp glow disappeared. At once, Miles was up again and prying at the nails. An eighth nail was out, a ninth, a tenth. Winnie counted them carefully, while behind her counting, her mind still sang, stone walls do not a prison make. Miles handed down the prying tool, and he grasped the bars of the window firmly, ready to pull, but just stood poised. What is he waiting for, thought Winnie. Why doesn't he? But then
then a flash of lightning, and soon after that, a crack of thunder. And in the midst of that noise, Miles gave a mighty heave, but the window did not budge. The thunder ebbed. Winnie's heart sank. What if it was all impossible? What if the window would never come out? What if... And then she looked over her shoulder at the dark shape of the gallows, and she shuddered. Again, there was a flash of lightning, and this time a crashing burst of noise from the swirling sky. Miles yanked. The window frame sprang free, and still grasping it by the bars, he tumbled backwards off the box. The job was done. Two arms appeared in the hole left by the missing frame. May, her head appeared, but it was too dark to see her face. The window. What if it was too small for her to squeeze through? What if, but now her shoulders were out. She groaned softly and then another flash of lightning lit her face for an instant. And Winnie saw an expression there of deep concentration, the tip of her tongue protruding, brows furrowed. Now Tuck was up on the box, helping her, giving her his own shoulders to pull on. Miles and Jesse close at his sides, arms upstretched, eager to receive her bulk. Her hips, her hips were free now. Look out! And here she came, her skirts tearing on the rough edges of the boards, arms flailing. And then they were all in a heap on the ground. Another crash of thunder muffled Jessie's bursting, exultant laugh. May was free. Winnie clapped her hands, trembling them, trembling, clapped her trembling hands thankfully. And then the first drop of rain plopped precisely on the tip of Winnie's nose. One by one, as the rain began, they all drew her to them and kissed her. And one by one, she kissed them back. Was that rain on May's face, on Tuck's, or was it tears? Jesse was last. He put his arms around her and hugged her tight and whispered one single word. Remember. Then Miles was on top of the box again, lifting Winnie. Her hands grasped the edges of the window. This time she waited with him. When the thunder came, it tore the sky apart with its roar. And as it came, she pulled herself through the window and dropped down onto the cot inside unharmed. She looked up at the open square and saw the frame with Miles' hands holding it. The next roll of thunder saw it wedged once more back into place, and then would Miles put back the nails? She waited. Rain came down in sheets now, riding the wind, flung crosswise through the night. Lightning crackled a brilliant jagged streak, and thunder rattled the little building. The tension in the parched earth eased and vanished. Winnie felt it go. The muscles of her stomach loosened, and all at once, she was exhausted. But still, she waited. Would Miles put back the nails? At last, standing tiptoe up on the cot, she grasped the bars of the window, pulling herself up till she could just see through. Rain blew into her face, but at the next flash of lightning, looking down, she saw that the jailhouse yard was empty. And before the thunder followed, in the pause, while wind and rain held back for one brief moment, she thought she heard, fading in the distance, the tinkling little melody of the music box. The tucks, her darling tucks, were gone. Okay, that was chapter 24. So Winnie had she, in her mind, she was making a difference. She had a job to do. She needed to help the Tux. The Tux needed her. And um, so she was successful. Uh, so she is now in the jailhouse and the constable believes that the person in May's cell is actually May. And of course, it's, it's Winnie right now. So that is the end of chapter 24.